Now I'll hum the Jeopardy theme song. I won't really do that. And there we go. Excellent. All right, cool. So I'll hum the Jeopardy theme song. Oh, let's let's uh, let's stop that. All right, and now we're gonna share the screen. And let's present. Okay, y'all. So first of all, this is the, this is our last class. It's five in a series of jujitsu history. If you're joining us for the first time, thank you for checking it out. A bunch of you have been here the whole way. So thank you for being here. I really appreciate your support for the project. I've had a ton of fun with it. I think it'll be really enjoyable for years to come. If you missed any of them, they're all archived on the Dirty White Belt YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Dirty White Belt. So we're going to do two things today. And the first, we're going to talk about jujitsu history with an explanation of how what we call the unified rules of both MMA and the unified rules of sport jujitsu as defined by the IBJJF and ADCC, how those things evolved and came to be. There's some really interesting historical details. We'll spend the first 20 minutes doing that. From there, we'll go into a discussion of modern sport competition jiu-jitsu, past the early UFCs in 1993 to the founding of the IBJJF, the first world championships in 96. And by the end of this, I'm going to run down who I think the greatest of all time is for both men's grappling and women's grappling. And I'm really excited to talk to you all about that because I think some of these grapplers you will have heard of and you'll be intimately familiar with. It's always good to revisit that greatness. But some of them, my hope for you is that you will learn some new grapplers to check out. The last few slides, I have links to some epic matches that I think that you all will enjoy. So I always have to start by acknowledging that we're learning more about jujitsu history all the time. And that's thanks to guys like Roberta Pedrera, Robert Drysdale, Tufi Kairos, Wendy Rouse. I hope that you will support those folks. Without them, presentations like this wouldn't be possible. I hope you will go see the Closed Guard, the documentary, when it comes out later this summer. And yes, we will have a screening of that here in Bellingham, hopefully at Fairhaven Outdoor Cinema in the summer. So. The way martial arts evolve depends on the societies that they evolve in. Competition is more than just the test of your abilities. It's how martial arts remain alive, which makes them effective, and they evolve to meet the needs of the societies. Also, they help us argue with each other on the internet, which is going to be super fun for everybody. I always use the example of how in Okinawa, most of the weapons that they use in karate are based on farm implements, because a lot of people that practiced karate were farmers that wanted to resist military occupation. A lot of legend has it in southern China. A lot of those fighting styles developed because you had to fight in boats, so they have low stances. The society that you grow up in helps you evolve your martial art because you're going to do the things that are effective for the society that you live in. And competition is more than a test of your abilities. It's how martial arts remain alive and help them evolve to meet those needs. If I do something that's ineffective and I do it to someone who's trying to resist, I'm going to do something different next time until I find something that really works. And that's how technique evolves as well. Rule sets also become set up as a result because rule sets drive behaviors. Wrestlers privilege takedowns because that's how you win. They privilege pins because that's how you win. Jiu-Jitsu uh, favors submissions because that's how you win. So the way that rules evolve in what we now call MMA, what used to be called Valet Tudo, uh, is a really interesting story in and of its own right. And that's a story of how rules become standardized. Before we get into any of that, and welcome folks just joining, we're going to talk about Let's talk about the table of contents. We're going to start with history, but that's only going to be about 20% of the presentation before we kick into modern sport jujitsu. We're going to talk about ultimate fighting. We're going to talk about when Hoist Gracie shocked the world in the first four UFCs and nobody could beat him. Then we're going to talk about how that started to evolve because the public, although they appreciated how effective jujitsu was, they liked to see stand up fighting a little bit more. We'll talk about how that informed the evolution of the rules. Then we'll talk about how sport jujitsu came about and how uh, the, uh, that led to the creation of the IBJJF, which is currently and still the biggest stage in grappling, at least for the gi. From there, we're going to talk about the most prestigious no-gi grappling tournament, the Submission Grappling Giant ADCC, the Abu Dhabi Combat Club. We'll talk about no-gi's growth more generally and its popularity. We'll talk a little bit about rule sets drive behaviors, which is going to help me talk about my criteria for how we truly establish the greatest of all time. You can obviously break down the greatest of all time in many different categories, right? The greatest in the gi, the greatest no gi, the greatest submission only, the greatest with strikes involved, all this stuff. These are all fun things, but I've done my best to compile a list of criteria that help us determine who the greatest of all time, well-rounded concerning all manner of rule sets and modalities. And then we're going to talk about who the goat is. And it says, prove me wrong. Please don't prove me wrong. The reason for that, that I say that is, there is no goat. 
and yet long live the goat anyway. I'm going to start with a framework, and I apologize to Drew if you're watching for stealing the name of your school. We're going to talk about the rise of sport MMA and sport jujitsu and how those competitive forces have changed and evolved over time. To start with that, this is Rafael Mendez. Now, Rafael Mendez is not the goat, or maybe he is, because there's no one way to decide who the greatest of all time is, right? You need to have criteria. And what are criteria based on? They're based on the things that you value, and that drives your decision making. Because people value different things, right? Some people value self-defense. Some people value entertainment. Some people value, I want to compete in all modalities. Some people just love the gi. Your criteria are going to change who you think the GOAT is. And that's all right. And so more importantly, even if you're totally confident in what your criteria are, when you're talking about the greatest of all time, you're talking about people of profound achievement. And so at the level we're going to talk about, the distinctions between these folks are really thin and really mutable. So for me, there is no one true definitive GOAT, although I'll try to give you one or two uh, toward the end of the presentation. But these things are really fun to talk about. And more than being fun, they help us relive those achievements which helps us learn from the achievements of the greatest ever to do it, which is really exciting. And it also helps us introduce people to a new audience that maybe missed them when they were actively competing, folks like Rafael Mendez, who are no longer competing, who are now retired. And that brings me back to Hoffa, the man on your screen. He definitely needs to be in the conversation of the greatest of all time because his prime was so utterly dominant. For six or seven years, nobody could touch him. He beat other all-time greats. He made a lot of top-tier competitive black belts look like blue belts. And if what you're looking for is who was the best at your peak, he's a great answer. If you're looking for who had the best total career, maybe not because his career prime was so short. However, if you're looking for somebody whose jujitsu was pure poetry, whose technique was the technique that gets you excited to go out and train because it looks beautiful and it's incredibly effective and it just works even on bigger, stronger, uh, more aggressive opponents, that's one guy. And if, you, if I had to pick one person's matches to watch for the rest of my life, he's a great choice. He's my favorite grappler of all time. And I've learned a ton just from watching him compete. So here's the thing, that's me. But everybody should have one or two grapplers that they just love to watch. And as we talk about the evolution of sport fighting, we're gonna talk yes about who the best competitors of all time were. We're also gonna introduce you to some figures that maybe you've never heard of, maybe you've never seen grapple. Because one of my goals for this talk is to help some of you newer folks who are white belts find your Rafael Mendez, the person that gets you excited to go train, the person that makes you say, man, I can't believe that she pulled that off in competition. How do I do that? That's what excites me about jujitsu. Nobody excites y'all too. But we're going to start with MMA. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about the early UFCs. Rules are going to be a main theme today. And I want to start with one big idea, which is martial arts have practical value and they also have entertainment value. And those are two sort of different poles. What works is not always what's most fun to watch. The Hoist Gracie Dan Severn fight from the early UFCs is a great example. Incredibly effective. Hoist beats a guy who's 80 pounds heavier, a devastating grappler, somebody who's beaten everybody else. But to the average person, it just looks like two dudes doing very little until hoist triangles them. And it's hard for the untrained eye to even see what's happening. Now compare that to modern UFCs. Like if you watch the Dustin Poirier fight with um, Dan Hooker the other night, I don't even like watching striking, but that was undeniably incredibly exciting. And yet if I were trying to defend myself against Dan Hooker, I wouldn't stand and trade with him. I would do something else. So effectiveness is not all the, the same as entertainment value. And that's something that you're really going to have to remember as we talk about uh, how uh, MMA rules evolved. Because UFC 1 really changed everything in 1993. And Hoist Gracie, who a lot of y'all know, uh, I trained under, I trained in the Hoist Association. My black belt is from Hoist Gracie black belt, Seth Champ. And so I'm intimately familiar with all this stuff. It was, it was really drilled into me as I started training. Uh, but at the time, humans didn't really know what effective fighting looked like. And so they had a tournament. And in the first tournament, there were really no rules. And uh, when I say no rules, well, I'll, I'll, I'll speak explicitly on the next slide, but Hoist beats three guys in one night. He beats a competitive middleweight boxer, National Golden Gloves champion. He beats Ken Shamrock, himself a legend of MMA, about whom we'll say more in a bit. And he beats Gerard Godot, a badass Dutch kickboxer. He beats these three guys all in one night. He submits them all in under four, four minutes. So what were the rules for this event? It was explicitly a no rules fighting event. They locked two dudes in a cage. The only way the fight ended was someone was rendered unconscious, someone gave up, or the corner threw in the towel. All techniques were explicitly legal, and the only techniques on the prohibited list 
were biting, eye gouging, and groin shots. And if you did that, they wouldn't make you stop and they wouldn't disqualify you. They would fine you $1,500. And so an illegal technique wasn't, okay, no, you can't grab the fence. You can't, oh, you're punching them in the groin. We're going to disqualify you. No, it's like, well, we're going to take that out of your purse later. So really everything went. And by the way, uh, they would legalize groin shots later, as a lot of y'all know from watching Keith Hackney punch Joe Sun in the balls about 25 times, which Joe Sun, as it turned out, had coming. In the second UFC, Hoist wins again, beating, beating Minoki Ichihara, Jason DeLucia, Remco Pardue, and Pat Smith all in one night. This is a real example of the pole of martial effectiveness, right? It's undeniably effective. If you lock two dudes in a cage, one of them wins over and over again. So jujitsu really proved its effectiveness on that night. And the success of it, launched a billion dollar industry, modern mixed martial arts. Everybody watches the UFC now, there are cards every weekend. It also catapulted Gracie Jiu Jitsu to prominence, which was exactly what Hori and Gracie, Hoyce's brother who founded the UFC, had intended. And it set the stage for other forms of competitive submission grappling. And some of those look a lot like the combat that, that the Gracies did in Brazil and when they came to America, and some, some of them don't. Some of them evolved their own forms of competitive submission grappling. Not to say one is better than the other, but certainly, certainly different. However, I mentioned that, you know, although everybody, everybody on this call, you love combat sports, right? Or you wouldn't be spending your Tuesday night with me, for which I'm grateful. So you're already in the upper echelon of people that are the audience for this type of stuff. But if you wanted to make it a business and market it to a mass audience, things have to change. So how do we get from the first four UFCs where the rules were really minimal and basically everything goes to the UFC of today? And the answer is entertainment and keeping the product fresh. So after the first four UFCs, there was a shift away from the tournament format, the three or four fights in one night to win sort of thing. UFC 5 introduced the first singles match, which was a rematch between Ken Shamrock on your left here and Hoist Gracie. They called it the super fight. And this proved to be a really important development because singles matches featuring fighters that didn't have damage already would become some of those popular events. A lot of people were like, okay, well, if Hoist loses to someone, we don't want it, that to be because he was worn out from fighting chemo, right? Or if Ken Shamrock loses, we don't want it to be because he got his elbow popped. We want to have a true outcome between Hoist and Ken. So later, this would completely phase out tournament matches, right? Like the UFC doesn't have tournaments anymore, as everybody knows. And that starts with UFC 5. UFC 6 was the first event to crown a non-tournament champion, which was this man on the left, Ken Shamrock. Ken's a pioneer of MMA in other ways as well. He started the first fight camp, arguably, which is called the Lions then. So he was a pioneer both in terms of championships and in terms of training methods. But the real turning point is UFC 21 in Brazil when the UFC abandoned the tournament format entirely for an entire card, and they would only do one one-off tournament one time later in Japan. They would never really go back after that. So fans found the single matches entertaining, and, and, and that's the thing. It's, it's, it's about entertainment. If you're building a business, you want to entertain the fans, and that will inform the unified rules. But as much as fight fans found these singles fights entertaining, politicians really didn't. And we're talking about John McCain here, uh, the now deceased former Republican senator and presidential candidate. He famously called MMA human cockfighting. It's interesting because McCain was a fan of boxing, but he didn't really see the value in combat sports like MMA and tried to get it banned and honestly succeeded in a lot of elements. And he called, so McCain was a senator from Arizona at the time. And once he saw a tape of the first UFCs, he sent a letter to every state governor asking them to ban it. And at its peak, 36 states responded and, and banned no holds barred fighting, including New York. And this has a huge impact on the UFC because MMA isn't legal in New York for a long time, even though they have a fight scheduled at Madison Square Garden. And so UFC 12, which is supposed to be at Mad Madison Square Garden, after New York State bans it, they have to relocate to Alabama at the very last minute, Dothan, Alabama. So money changes everything, right? And you got to remember that the UFC is in the entertainment business, not the effective fighting business at that point. Although, of course, MMA is still probably the truest individual, like single combat metric. But it's tough to be in the entertainment business if 36 states won't do business with you. So at that point, the UFC starts to reach out to state athletic commissions. And guys, you, have, you probably have heard of uh, start working on unified rules. And they gradually start to limit sort of the things 
that make MMA, early MMA, really interesting for people who are interested in solo combat. They outlaw a lot of techniques. By UFC 12, they outlaw, they introduce weight classes, right? So you don't longer have freak show fights like Hoist versus the sumo wrestler Akebono. They outlaw techniques like fish hooking. For UFC 14, they start making gloves mandatory. Gloves were not mandatory before. You could have one glove like Art Jimerson or bare hands like Hoist. In UFC 15, they start enacting restrictions on hair pulling because in an early event, Hoist pulls out Kimo's ponytail. Ouch, still hurts to watch. They ban strikes to the back of the head. They ban headbutting. They ban small joint manipulations to get bend people's fingers back anymore. Finally, much to my chagrin, they ban groin strikes. And at UFC 21, and this is really a watershed, they introduce five minute rounds. Now, why does that matter? Because if Ken Shamrock takes you down and goes for your foot and he's got an ankle lock on you and the bell rings, cool, you didn't have to escape. The ref stands you up. Now, if, if there's no time limit, nobody's coming to save you. And that really exemplifies for me the difference between fighting for entertainment and fighting for, for self-defense. The rounds and the 10-point must scoring system the boxing uses really sort of makes that transition. So uh, Jeff Blatnick, who's the commissioner of the UFC at the time, John McCarthy, Big John, who a lot of people remember as a legendary ref, and Joe Silva, who's still a UFC matchmaker, create a model of pot, uh, the manual, excuse me, of policies, procedures, codes of conduct, and rules to help getting the UFC sanctioned by athletic commissions, because athletic commissions are not going to sanction them if they don't recognize it as a sport rather than a spectacle and a freak show. So New Jer California is the first state to sign off on these unified rules, but New Jersey hosts the first ever event under what we now know as the unified rules on UFC 28 in November of 2000. In January 20, 2001, the, the Fertitta brothers uh, buy it under their Zufa Corporation, and uh, the rest is history. It becomes a multi-billion dollar business, and now we all get to watch fights, which is pretty great. Uh, why is Marilu Bustamante there? I said I wanted to introduce you guys to some people that you might not have heard of that are still legendary badasses, and although Marilu Bustamante does not make my top five list of jiu-jitsu fighters, he is one of the best all-around jiu-jitsu representatives in MMA ever, won the UFC belt at 38 years old, also an Abu Dhabi champion, and if you're not familiar with him, get familiar. So let's talk a little more about rules, and then we'll get into the sport grappling. These are the rules of a jiu-jitsu fight that Kande Koma, uh, Count Koma, Mitsuo Maeda, made when he was born storming through Brazil. They're basically submission grappling rules. Rules have always mattered and they would evolve considerably over the first 90 years of jujitsu from when the coma troop comes and when they decided, hey, these West Point cadets think they win by pinning me, even though I arm locked them and submitted them. We need to clarify this, that if you tap out, it doesn't matter if my shoulders are down, which are in these rules. Or when a lot of Japanese judoka come and start throwing the Gracie brothers around thinking, okay, this is how I'm going to win. But to the Gracie brothers, you don't win unless you get submitted. And so these are things that are challenges of culture and challenges of viewpoint that will have to be negotiated later. And that, as we'll see, still exist in sport jujitsu even today. To the Gracies, they're creating a self-defense art that you don't win unless you, or you don't lose unless you get finished. Whereas to a lot of other folks, they're like, well, I'm used to getting points for throws. I'm used to, if I dominate position, I win. And this is a bit of a, a clash in perspective. So controversy about, and, and, and part of why it's important to have unified rules is if the combatants don't agree on who wins by doing what, you get a lot of controversial matches, right? And the one guy claims he won, the other guy claims he won. And if you read Humberto Pedrero's book, Shockey, you'll see there's a lot of controversial matches with each fighter saying, well, no, I achieved my objective, I won. If we don't agree on the objectives, and a lot of times in these early fights, the objectives have to be negotiated specifically, then it's really hard to know who wins, especially in a style versus style match. So for example, a Capoeira fighter loses a fight with George Gracie because he kicks George when he's down and the rules they've negotiated say you can't kick a downed opponent. In other fights, Capoeira fighters are allowed to kick while standing but not punch. There's also the negotiation of what people wear. A lot of fighters like Carlos Gracie will require their opponent to wear the gi. Other fighters like Jill Omori don't care. They'll fight you gi or no gi. Famously in George's match with uh, Mario Alesio, George wears a gi Mario Alesio, it is negotiated, wears what is described as a sailor's blouse. And so there's all this different stuff where you have to negotiate a little bit at a time. So why does this matter? Because if there is no unified understanding of what the rules are, there can't be a clear winner under a universally agreed upon rule set. So this won't really happen, this universally agreed upon rule set, until the 90s. 
The guy in the middle there is Carlos Gracie Jr., son of obviously Carlos Gracie Sr. He's the head of Gracie Baja still, and he founded the, the International Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu Federation in 1994. Now, this is still the world's most prominent sports jiu-jitsu organization. And part of the reason the IBJJF is founded is to establish unified rules so that we will all have a shared framework for who wins sport matches. Also, part of the reason that they found it is because there's controversy about, like, at this time, karate students are giving out belts, black belts, to 10, 12-year-old kids. And so in addition to the unified rules framework, Carlos and the IBJJF want to establish a unified belt, like age requirement and time in requirement framework, so that we avoid that problem, so that the black belt continues to mean something in jiu-jitsu. Now, one thing I want to be clear about, the IBJJF is not like the International Judo Federation, which is a governing body in the interest of judo as a sport. The IBJJF is a for-profit corporation that exists to make money, and that does play into it. Nevertheless, it is indisputable that the IBJJF is, at least for the gi, the most prestigious world championship in jiu-jitsu. And speaking of that, they hold their first world championship in 1996, and these are all gi tournaments. The IBJJF won't host a no-gi Worlds until 2007. So bear this in mind uh, when you're thinking about like IBJJF Worlds and no-gi honors. The, the emphasis of the IBJJF has, has always been the gi. So in the interest of uh, mem memorializing some folks that maybe you haven't heard of, Amori Bacech down here is the first absolute champion of IBJJF Worlds in 1996. He wins the first two competitions uh, in the absolute, which is the open weight class and deserves to be remembered for that. He also has a, a UFC fight early on and has now earned his coral belt. So that's how the IBJJF happens. And I wanna set that as a framework because we're gonna talk a lot about IBJJF world championships later on when we're talking about who the greatest competitors of all time are. So at this point, we have a unified gi rule set. But then something happens because a lot of people like to, to grapple without the gi on, right? And a little funny side note here. Uh, the guy at the center started training in 1995 with a Gracie Baja black belt named Nelson Montero. And this guy in the center is arguably more important than anybody in terms of modern submission grappling. And even more so than some of the people in this picture. And a lot of you will recognize Gabby Garcia, who's one of the greatest women competitors of all time. Henzo Gracie, who's a legend. Um, all the And Rubens Cabrinha, who is also one of the best competitors of all time. So who is this guy in the center? There's a clue to his identity in the picture, and if you've guessed it, pat yourself on the back. So that guy is Sheikh Tanun bin Zayed. He's the son of the ruler of the United Arab Emirates, the sixth son of the, of the leader of, uh, of that country. And so when Sheikh Tanun left his country to go to California, decided he was going to train jiu-jitsu, walks into Nelson Montero's gym, starts training, really falls in love with him by all accounts, and just immerses himself in jiu-jitsu. So when he goes, goes home to Abu Dhabi, he invites his instructor, Nelson Montero, to come with him. Now, you probably know the grappling organization that they founded, the Abu Dhabi Combat Club, which is ADCC. And the ADCC uh, Submission Wrestling World Championship is far and away the most prestigious no-gi honor in the world. Most people will agree on that, and I don't think it's especially close. I don't really identify with billionaires a lot. Like, it's just not my mentality. But I will tell you, and I don't have a lot in common with uh, any sheikh, but particularly one who's uh, the son of a king of a country. But I will say I've always felt a particular affinity with Sheikh Tanun because he's a low profile dude who just really loves jujitsu. And if I was the son of the ruler of a wealthy country, I would probably do much the same thing with at least some of my money as he did. I'd have the best grapplers in the world come and teach me stuff. I'd set up a tournament so the best grapplers in the world could come and compete at it. And I would provide jobs for all my friends who do jujitsu because Sheikh Tanun has also influenced the jujitsu world in a lot of other ways. He got jujitsu into the public schools in Abu Dhabi. So 76,000 kids currently train there because of him at uh, 160 different public schools. And if you have a black or a brown belt in jujitsu, you can get a job and go train and teach there for money, which actually our own Professor Moro has done. Um, so that's his influence and real influence in the world of martial arts. So let's talk a little bit about ADCC rules. I assume folks are more familiar with, Ab with uh, IBJJF rules, uh, and we won't go too much into the specifics of the rules unless people are interested in that. But it's a wrestling heavy rule set. This is submission grappling, not Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, even though Jiu Jitsu people do really well there. 
all submissions are explicitly legal, which is really important because they want to invite high level athletes from all the grappling world, from Lucha Livre, from wrestling, catch wrestling, judo, jujitsu, sambo, and MMA grapplers, guys like Mark Kerr, who are wrestlers, um, guys like Oleg, you know, all these dudes who are not explicitly jujitsu practitioners, but are high level grapplers. So it's a wrestling heavy rule set that penalizes guard pulling and lots of tournaments use the rule set, including the ADCC qualifier. And speaking of the ADCC qualifier, one of the things that makes this so prestigious is you only get to compete if you were invited, if you win a qualifier, and there are only a couple of qualifiers in the world, you have to win in order to get an invite, or you have to be a previous, a winner of a previous ADCC gold medal. So it's really exclusive and people that have competed, even just competing there is a great honor, let alone winning. So one interesting note that will come up later is every year ADCC hosts, they just like any jujitsu tournament, they have their weight class events and they have their absolute events, but they also have a super fight. And the super fight, is where the last two absolute division champions usually compete against each other. Now, this is an incredibly prestigious thing, and we'll get into why when we get into the discussion of the GOAT, but only seven people ever have won what's called the ADCC Triple Crown, which is winning your weight, winning absolute, and also winning a super fight. That's a really impressive list, and it's Mario Sperry, Mark Kerr, the Smashing Machine, Ricardo Arona, Hodger Gracie, Braulio Estima, Dean Lister, and Andre Galvao. We'll talk about most of those folks today, but the reason I'm mentioning it, if you have a couple of reasons. First of all, if you haven't watched the documentary about Mark Kerr, which is called The Smashing Machine, you really must do so. It's a really, it's a tough watch, but an incredible one. And The Rock, Dwayne Johnson is actually making a movie about Mark Kerr as well. Second reason I bring it up, on the list of all-time greats who are unjustly remembered for one match that went bad for them, Ricardo Arona is exhibit 1A. He's got three ADCC gold medals and is one of only nine people to get that many ADCC gold medals. He's one of seven people to win the Triple Crown, but everybody just remembers him because he's the guy that got powerbombed by Quentin Rampage Jackson in pride and knocked unconscious. So it's a bummer that for all of his achievements, he's remembered for that. Last thing I want to say about ADCC, at least for now, is that ADCC didn't add women's divisions to the event until 2005. They're still smaller than the men's divisions. They only have two weight divisions for women, which is kind of unfair and crappy if you think about all the different body types that you have there to have two different weight classes, as opposed to like the six or seven that the men get. They've only held an absolute division for women twice. But the women's matches are also really fascinating because, because there's only two weight classes, you get a lot of interesting matchups that you wouldn't get elsewhere. And we will definitely say more about that later. Some of the women's matches at ADCC are some of the best grappling entertainment you'll ever get. So that is legendary Hoyler Gracie. And that's a quote from him where he says, the first ADCC tournament marked the beginning of the modern era of submission grappling. One interesting thing about ADCC, up until then, nogi was something that people did but mostly people did it with punches and kicks involved, at least in the jujitsu schools that I was training in. Most of you know, as I mentioned, that I came up training under Hoist, and Hoist legitimately does not understand no gi jujitsu. He feels like if he's not wearing a gi, he should be able to punch you. And that was sort of the prevailing sentiment in a lot of the jujitsu world at the time. But ADCC changed everything, and it remains to this day the most prestigious no gi grappling honor. This tournament started happening years before, as I mentioned, IBJJF No Gi Worlds, and that's one reason it's more prestigious. The other reason is that unlike IBJJF No Gi Worlds, you can leg lock people here. At the IBJJF, you never get to do heel hooks, which you do in ADCC, and that just cuts out a lot of, you know, cuts out a lot of techniques. And so a lot of people feel, particularly the leg lock crowd, feel like it's a truer outcome at ADCC that you would get at IBJJF No Gi Worlds. So Hoyler, before we move on, I just want to mention that Hoyler is exhibit 1B on the Hicardo Arona list of people who are unjustly remembered for one match. So Hoyler is an all-time great. He has a good case to be the best featherweight ever. He's not my personal pick. We'll talk about that in a second. But he won the first four IBJJF World Championships. He won the first three ADCC Championships. He's the only featherweight to ever medal at the Worlds and Brazilian Nationals in absolute, which he did both times. This is despite the fact that his prime years happened before the modern era of sport jujitsu. He was that famous match that he had with Eddie Bravo. He was 38. He was 31 when the first IBJJF Worlds happened. So it's a bummer that most people know him as the guy that lost that one match to Eddie Bravo uh, because legitimately a legend and one of the top three featherweights ever, undisputably. Um, so with that in mind, this leads us up to a big question. If I say 
Hoyler is in the contender for the featherweight code. How do we determine who the actual greatest of all time is? Let's talk about where we stand here. And believe me, and just so you know, this is as of people's career achievements as of today, as of on the cusp of July 2020. Let's also get to the disclaimers. As I mentioned, who the greatest is really depends on who, what you value. Depending on what criteria you use, might, you might reach one conclusion or another. That's why it's always going to be interesting and controversial to talk about this stuff. So I don't claim that my ranking is definitive, but it is my best judgment after doing research into four areas that we're about to talk about. I'm not meaning to denigrate anyone through this list, quite the opposite. This is meant to be a celebration of achievement, the examination of some incredibly impressive performances, and to give the newer folks among y'all a jumping off point into whose careers to pay attention to that aren't currently competing. So remember, this is also an examination of total career achievement, so it's not static. These rankings could change because a lot of these folks are still competing. In fact, a lot of the folks that are in my top five are not done yet. Let's also be clear about what this discussion isn't. This isn't my in their prime who would beat who thing. It's a discussion of the total value of a career. So how do we establish that? So I think you have to and this is something me and my man David Porter agree on. For the overall rankings, we have to be multimodal. If you're going to be the overall GOAT, you can't just be a monster in the gi and neglect no gi. You can't just be a no gi badass but not do anything in the gi. These rankings are going to consider gi grappling, or gi grappling, yes, in points tournaments and submission only tournaments. No gi grappling in points tournaments and in submission only tournaments with different rule sets, different formats. We're not going to think about MMA this time because it's a whole different can of worms. But eventually, I'm going to use the tools that I developed for this, and I, yes, I did make a spreadsheet because I'm a nerd, to break out the gi goat, the no gi goat, and maybe the MMA and Valley Tudo goats as well. So these are the primarily prestigious events that we're considering. IBJJF no gi, or IBJJF Worlds and PANS titles, Super Fight titles, uh, ADCC titles, IBJJF no gi Worlds despite its problems, and Super Fight titles as well. So that's my, my mentality looking into this. But we're already halfway done, and y'all are probably real ready to get started talking about grapplers. So let's talk about that. We're going to look at, this is my criteria, we're going to look at the totality of a career. How good were they at their peak? How consistent was their excellence over their total body of work? So if you were awesome for three years, great, but you're probably not going to make the rankings. We're going to look at their era. How much better were they than the peers of their era? And how good were their peers? Were you amazing against another world-class person? Or did you have a division that sort of made you look good? And finally, and we're not going to weight the fourth category as heavily as we do the first three, but we should look at it as well. What was their broader impact on the art, their influence? Did they change the game? Guys like Fernando Terrare or Leozinho, Leo Vieira, they only won one or two world championships each, but everybody who did jiu-jitsu modeled certain things after them, and they changed the way that things operated. That's also true of Rafael Mendes. And so we're going to look at that, the sort of Velvet Underground factor, where the Velvet Underground's first album only sold about a thousand copies, but every single person who bought it started a band. So let's start, shall we? Let's shout. So here's some folks that are not in the top five. We're going to start with the women, because the women's divisions are really, really interesting, and more people should know about them. Um, these folks are not in the top five, but they're folks you should know anyway. So you have to honor the legends. And Leca Vieira there on the left was a force of nature when what we live today was just being built. I talked to her on the podcast about starting to train and she was the only woman in a gym of about 45 huge fighter dudes. And her dedication showed in the results. She was a dominant force in her era. In the era that followed on the right, Kira Gracie came into her own. Now let's not kid ourselves. There's still a lot of sexism in jujitsu and it sucks and it's incumbent on each of us to root it out. But Kira, her own family, a lot of members wouldn't train her. It wasn't until her uncle Henzo uh, agreed to train her, which they talk about in the film Henzo Gracie Legacy, which I definitely recommend you watch, that, you know, she bonded with her uncle with good reason. And we're all, we should all be grateful for that, because what we got was an outstanding grappling career. Kira, we got to see her grappling star rise. She became a three-time ADCC champion, a four-time IBJJF champion. She also won Absolute in 2008. And so Kira was the, the Gracie woman the, the, that really made the biggest difference in the early scene. For the newer generation, and some of you on this call are lucky enough to get to train with this person in the center, Dominica Olenetti. She started training with uh, Marcelo Garcia when she was just a kid. And she broke out into the scene with a really innovative guard game, which I still learn from. And we've been, I'm lucky to train with Dom a bunch. Those of you that train at Bellingham BJJ got to train with her. We're hopefully going to bring her back after COVID. And Here's the thing. She won four world championships, including two absolute titles in a row. 
And this is sort of a bummer. It's not sort of, it is a bummer. Then she hurt her shoulder, had to have surgery, went to art school, so had different priorities in her life. And just as she was starting to make her comeback into competition, the pandemic happened. So we haven't gotten to see her compete in a while. Even if she never competes again, though, in my estimation, Dom's place in jiu-jitsu history is secure. And here's why. Not only was she an amazing competitor and probably will still be again when she comes back, she's a great person. And, you know, to be real, there's not, you know, there's a lot of folks that fall short in that regard. Being a black belt doesn't mean you're a black belt in life. But Dom is both a great black belt and a great person who raises money for great causes, speaks out on issues that matter, and we're really lucky to have her. So you should know those names. Here are some other folks in the top five that you should know. And we'll start with Luana Alzagir on the right. I'm lucky enough to have Luana sign my white belt when I was competing at the Worlds. And uh, she's a legend who doesn't always get the credit she deserves. Uh, her wife, Luana, or her, her wife, Ana Carolina Vieira, is also one of my favorite current grapplers competing. Luana retired a while ago and still competes occasionally, but Ana Carolina is very active. She's a three time world champ and a no gi world champ. But uh, Luana, in her time, was one of the absolute best. Five time IBJJF world champ. She won absolute one year, and she also won an ADCC gold medal. Unfortunately, not enough to get her into the top five, but uh, an incredible guard game, great top game, and really, really worth seeking her out to watch her matches. In the lower weight classes right now, Rika Koyuasa, incredible. Four-time IBJJF world champ, and if you can't tell from the photo, she is tiny. Um, she is the, the best currently out there in the smallest two weight classes. Her lasso guard game is just fantastic and very, very much worth watching. Last and by no means least, in the middle there is the reigning two-time in a row absolute world champion, Natiele de Jesus. She's got five IBJJF world golds, including the last two in absolute. And I think Natiele is on the trajectory to be an all-time great and someone who, if the current trends continue, will get into that top five. You should watch her match with Gabby Garcia from the 2019 Pans. I've linked it in the end because she just loses by an advantage. You get someone that outweighs her by probably 60 pounds of solid muscle and catches Gabby in an Oma Plata at the end that she just doesn't have enough time to finish. And a lot of people feel like if she had another minute, she would probably have won that match. So uh, that's linked at the end. You should check that out. Other couple of names worth watching, Jazari Matuda, who is an all-time great. Bianca Basilio, who is actually my, my current favorite grappler to watch, reigning ADCC champion at her weight class, and um, is, you know, just one of the most exciting grapplers out there, period. And happy to say more about that in the question and answer at the end. So if those folks aren't in the top five, who is? This is the top five. And honestly, I feel like the distinction is between the top five and the rest it's pretty easy to draw for the women. The top two are teammates, actually coach and instructor, Leticia Hibero and Beatriz Bia Mesquita. They're both clear top five members. And for a long time, Leticia was my answer to the, the women's greatest of all time. She isn't anymore, and we'll get into why in a second. But ironically, she's coached a student who has pretty much surpassed her. They have 16 IBJJF world titles between them, and they're both on the top five list of total world championships. On the left is Hannette Stack. Hannette was an incredible competitor, multiple time world champ, ADCC champ, plus an ADCC super fight winner. Gabby Garcia down at the bottom. Now, a lot of you folks, if you don't know who Gabby is, because Gabby has, has only competed sporadically as she focuses on MMA, MMA in Japan. Gabby is a physically dominant force that cleaned out her division and hasn't lost in I don't know how long. Um, that being said, uh, we'll, we'll get into that a little bit in a second. And finally, Michelle Nicolini, who, uh, if those of you that train at Bellingham BJJ want to hear a story one time, but Michelle Nicolini actually plays a critical role in me and Betsy, my, my lovely and amazing wife's early relationship. More so than that, she's done it all. She's won basically every honor there is to win in the gi and no gi, and she's currently a successful MMA fighter in Singapore for the One Fighting Championship. So all of these folks are sort of the cream of the crop in terms of winning multiple world titles at the tournaments that matter, at the super fights that matter. So how do we rank them? So Gabby, I will be honest, is the toughest to rate because she's just an outlier. She's like Shaquille O'Neal in basketball, Wilt Chamberlain in basketball, or Brock Lesnar for, for combat sports. And let's compare her to Brock. Both are undeniably very good. Both are un und undeniably incredibly hard workers, have great teams, trains under Fabio Grigel at Alliance. But both also have a really unnatural size and strength advantages. And you can just see what a typical Gabby match looks like. If you watch that match with her and Natiele, and Natiele is one of the in one of the upper weight classes too, Gabby dwarfs her. 
And so the difference between Gabby and Brock is that Brock eventually ran into other physically comparable folks like Frank Muir, who had also trained, and Gabby never really did. So this isn't Gabby's fault, which makes it really hard to hold it against her, but it also has to be considered. In the same way that if, if Marcus Buchecha Almeida, who is an ultra heavyweight, if his only competition was Lucas Lepre or Bruno Malfacini, and he beat them, cool, but you don't weight that as, as heavily as you would somebody who was competing against people that were physically comparable. So this is why I rate her here. Although because nobody's been able to beat her in a while, her total number of titles is actually the lowest on the list. Now, some of that, you know, so she's a four-time ADCC champ. Can't front on that. She's won absolute there twice. She would have two more gold medals, but she popped for steroids in 2013, and they took away a couple of her IBJJF gold medals. She also closed out the absolute finals with, with Luana in 2010, so that could easily be counted as a Gabby gold medal as well. So, so she could have more gold medals than she has, and I just want to be upfront about that. But she also hasn't faced the type of competitive divisions that Bia Mosquita or Michelle Nicolini have. We'll talk about the murderer's row of competition that those two have faced when we get into talking about them. Her most impressive and convincing win is probably against Tayane Porfirio, who is big, but not as big as Gabby. And so it's not Gabby's fault that she's so much physically larger than everybody else, but it's real. I really wish that her era had overlapped more with Natielli's, so we get to see more of those matches. And I really wish her era had overlapped with Dominica's at all, because I would love to see the two of them compete. And who knows, maybe we'll get that match sooner or later. But until we do, Gabby clocks in for me at number five. Number four, Leticia Hibero. So Leticia is sort of in the Hoyler Gracie. For one thing, Hoyler was her instructor, but she's also sort of in the same boat as Hoyler in terms of the timing doesn't favor her. Until recently, I had her as my number one, but because all these other women are now entering their primes, whereas Leticia's prime really got cut off uh, before sport jujitsu really became a big thing. So other, you know, what changed? Other all-time greats like Michelle Nicolini kept competing while Leticia started focusing on teaching, and that may be her truest legacy, because not only did she produce athletes like Bia Mosquita, but Penny Thomas, who is another all-time great, and is also well worth knowing and watching her matches. But people deserve to know Leticia as a competitor, too, and as a truly elite one. She's a seven-time IBJJF World Champ, which is uh, tied for third most ever. Uh, she also won Nogi Worlds twice. Um, ADCC didn't start having women's divisions until 2005 and so she doesn't have an adcc championship and so that counts against her uh she has the hoiler problem right her dominance came a little too early so she clocks in at number four despite all her achievements because she doesn't have an adcc championship so you can't count that in her favor because she lost head to head when competing with other all-time greats like hanette but she deserves all the respect in the world for not just winning everything there was, but being probably the most influential women's coach in jiu-jitsu and for coaching another all-time great about whom we'll talk in a second. So I mentioned Hanette Stack, and yeah, I had to use that photo from her school, Brazil 21, in, uh, in Chicago. Hanette is an incredible competitor who has actually recently come back to, to competing after a long time off at the age of 40. But she has nothing to prove to anyone. She's a seven-time IBJJF World Championship, same amount as Leticia. She never won absolute in part because they didn't have an absolute division until 2007, but she did win absolute at ADCC in one of the two times they had an absolute division for women at ADCC. She's also a three-time ADCC gold medalist, so she's done it all in the gi, she's done it all no gi, and she's also won standout super fights, including one against Leticia Hibero, which you can watch in the links at the end of this, at the end of this presentation. She's also really comparable to, to Leticia in terms of career, both all-time great ass kickers who also made their mark as coaches. Hanette was a co-founder of the Brazilo 21 team and is still running her schools in Chicago. So I give her the slight nod against Leticia because of more competitive accolades, because of head-to-head -head record, but you really can't go wrong uh, in honoring either of these two. Number three, and number two. And here's the thing, this is going to be a controversial thing because a lot of people will put Bia number one and that's justifiable. And I'll be upfront that Bia will probably be number one before it's all said and done because Bia is only 29 years old and she's already won everything there is to win. She actually holds the record with nine IBJJF World Championships, which outpaces Michelle Nicolini who has eight uh, and, up, and Hanette has seven each, Gabby has six. She's also won ADCC one time and she's also won no gi worlds four times in the absolute there once. She's also won the pan six times. She's literally won everything there is to win. She even won EBI where she just destroyed everyone. 
She's been training since the, she was five years old and there's really nothing that she hasn't done. Also, I have an amazing photograph from IBJJF Worlds featuring the mighty Kim Rice, brown belt world champion, Leticia Hibero, Penny Thomas, and a young brown belt, Bia Mosquito, who still has braces. And I'll show you guys that photo sometime if you want. So if Bia has won everything there's to win, pretty much, why don't I have her number one on my list yet anyway? And that's because when looking at the totality of the record, the great Michelle Nicolini has done it all. She's done it in the gi. She's done it in no gi. She's done it in MMA. And while we're not really counting MMA here, I feel like that's worth mentioning. Here's why I'm ranking her number one. Of the top five, Bia has the most IBJJF gold medals. She has nine with two of those in absolute, but Michelle is a close second with eight. Michelle also has an absolute gold medal from the IBJJF in 2005, and Michelle is much smaller than Bia is. The year she won absolute, she was the lightest competitor in the lightest weight class, and she won absolute. Those of you that have done absolute divisions know how incredible that is. That's crazy. She's also won the IBJJF Worlds in three different weight classes, four if you count absolute as a separate weight class. One year, a checkmat teammate challenged her to enter the heavyweight division, and she did, even though she was a featherweight, and she won which is pretty, pretty outstanding. In 2010, th that was 2010, when she competed at heavyweight, just kind of to show she, sh she could. She also has four Nogi Worlds gold medals, which includes two absolute gold medals. She actually beat um, Bia to win one of those absolute gold medals. And you can see that match at the end of this. She's tied with Gabby Garcia and Luisa Montero for the most Nogi World Championships ever. And she's also got three ADCC medals with one of those gold. Now, Bia also has one ADCC gold, and she has some Nogi Worlds medals too. Uh, but as I said, she like uh, she beat uh, Michelle beat a young Bia in 2011 to win one of her absolute Nogi World titles. Now, let's let me be upfront about a couple things. I think it's worth noting that Michelle and Bia have the toughest fields among any of these top five. Uh, Gabby, Leticia, and Hanette had less stacked divisions, partially because the divisions were smaller early on, partially because there are fewer heavyweight women in the division with Gabby. But let me just list some of the people that Michelle and Bia have had to compete against, which is Tammy Musumichi, world champion, Mackenzie Dern, world champion, Omnia you know, successful UFC fighter now, Theon Davis, who may be one of, you know, who is in a meteoric rise, Bianca Basilio, Luisa Montero. Women's grappling has never been more exciting or more competitive than it has been in the last three to five years. And those are the divisions that these women are winning, which is why they are one and two on the list. Let me acknowledge two things. Bia has beaten Michelle more recently than, or yes, Bia has beaten Michelle more recently than Michelle has beaten Bia. Uh, she beat her as recently as 2016. And Bia isn't done. She's 29, whereas Michelle is nine years older. So assuming Bia keeps competing, it's very likely that she will be number one at some point, even in the next two years if she wins another couple of, of gold medals. So she has time to get there. But right now, my pick for the greatest of all time is the great Michelle Nicolini. And I don't think you can go wrong with that. So let's move on to the males. Here are a couple of names you should know. In America, heck yeah. Here's some Americans that you should know. We're going to start with the only three American men who have won the IBJJF Worlds in the game. These are there, they are. Rafael, Rafael Lovato Jr., he's American, only recently returned to gi competition because he'd been focusing on his very successful MMA career in Bellator. He was trained by the Hibero brothers, and he's one of the most well-rounded grapplers ever. He's amazing on top, amazing on bottom, amazing in the gi, amazing no gi, successful MMA career, and I'm glad people still get to see him compete. On the other hand, as good as BJ Penn was, most folks today, I don't think really understand how good BJ Penn was when he was competing. He has a good claim for the best lightweight ever in the UFC, and he'll always be the first American to win worlds. He was called the prodigy because he got his black belt in four years and then won the worlds at black belt, which is insane. Um, the average is 10, and even most black belts never get the chance to win the worlds, let alone their first worlds. But that was then. At this time, Mikey Musumichi there on the right is the man. He's the first American to ever win the Black Belt World title three times. He's the only American to win it multiple times. And he dethroned the great Bruno Malfacini, who maybe was probably one of the two best gi grapplers ever to live. And we'll talk about Bruno later on. And he's alone among his peers because even though Mikey is a light feather, he does the absolute. He competes against guys like Herbert Santos. And uh, that's just incredible. He's also a technical innovator that um, has really taken the Barambolo game to the next level. And everybody can watch, should watch his matches. If he keeps, keeps up this pace, the sky's the limit for Mikey. So everybody should know these three folks. You should also know these three folks. And I'm just going to be honest, 
it absolutely kills me to leave these guys out of the top five. And the fact that they are not in the top five tells you how utterly insane the top five is. I have to tell you that I had Shanji Ibero on the left in the top five until this morning. I was torn between him and another grappler that we'll get to in a second. And ultimately what made the difference is the other candidate had signature wins another over another elite all-time great. Whereas Shanji has a record of sustained excellence over many decades, but wasn't truly dominant. And I think this honestly proves something I'm gonna emphasize heavily. These distinctions, the, the distinctions we're making here are between the best of the best of the best. And so when I'm saying, hey, what's keeping you out of the top five is you didn't clearly establish yourself as better than Andre Galvao, Adolfo Vieira, or Jacare is crazy. That's even a criticism. Uh, and yet these are the thin distinctions we're going to have to make between grapplers in the top 10 and grapplers in the top five. Same with Bruno Malfasini. Now, Bruno Malfasini has 10 IBJJF World Championships. That is the record. And that's a, that's a crazy, crazy number. If this were a gi list, he would be right at the top. And I think he has a case for being the best gi grappler ever. Certainly top two. Um, certainly top three. Well, almost, I would put him in the top two. Um, but he doesn't have any no-gi world championships. And he doesn't have any ADCC titles. So it's hard for me to put him on a list that, that includes those things. And that kills me. It's really hard but it kills me. Last one, last two people. I'll mention also it kills me to leave Lucas Lepre off this list, but Lucas Lepre for all his honors, and he's one of the most, the best all around grapplers ever, uh, six world championships, has never won ADCC. And all of the guys in the top five have won ADCC. So let's talk about Cobrinha who has won ADCC three times and still doesn't make the top five. See, I wrote a whole blog post about this a couple of years ago. During his prime, Rafael Mendez was in Cobrinha's weight class. If Rafael Mendez didn't exist, we would probably be talking about Cobrinha as the undisputed greatest of all time. Because without Rafael Mendez, Cobrinha would probably have 11 world championships, five ADCC championships, plus super fights. That's an unreal resume. Even assuming something happens and he takes time off or he messes up one year, 10 world championships, four ADCCs, absolutely crazy. He had the misfortune or the challenge, if you choose to frame it that way, of being in the same division as one of the absolute best ever. And they had a legendary rivalry that, oh yeah, we're going to talk about in a minute. And if you haven't watched those matches, don't stop watching this because I want to get to the end of this, but watch those matches because they're two of the absolute best. And we were blessed to be living on the same earth at the same time as them, let alone to get to see their matches. How good was Cobrinha? He's an absolute joy to watch, and we could spend a lot of time naming other people worth watching. Rodolfo Vieira at heavyweight, who we'll talk about in the context of Cobrinha later, who had maybe the best match in jiu-jitsu history, which I've linked in the comments. Rodolfo Buchecha, generally considered the, the best jiu-jitsu match of the modern era, and you should definitely watch that. We could also talk about Fernando Terraray and Leo Vieira, who I already talked about, two of the most exciting grapplers ever, who only won two or so world championships each, but influenced whole generations of grapplers and changed the game for those that watched them. And I have to throw in a plug for Fernando Margarita Pontes, who always gets left out. He only won the Worlds three times, but is the forgotten champion and was an absolute force of nature. It was also influential. You can see me teach the Margarita Pass um, uh, with a D, not a T, although I will be having a Margarita later. Um, and, and so he has a lot of influence as well. So these are the guys that it absolutely killed me to leave off the top five. And you will see some of their matches in the comments. So who's in the top five, guys? These are my top five grapplers. You have Marcelo Garcia, the ADCC king, an all-around standout, a legend and an influential instructor. You have Hodger Gracie, Andre Galvao, Rafael Mendez, who we mentioned before, and Marcus Buchecha Almeida. You can see the little descriptions, but I want to say this. Let me just be honest. The absolute title and factoring that in favors the big guys. So you have to account for that. And I'm on the fence about this because to me, the absolute title is the most prestigious title around. It's like everybody, no matter what weight, enters. And the winner is a total badass. And frankly, the people that get on the podium are total badasses too. But that is a metric that favors heavier grapplers. So it punishes the smaller guys. So that's why I was on the fence about having Shanji Hibero or Rafael Mendez in the top five. But let me explain my thought process on the next slide. So number five is Rafael Mendez. And he's my favorite grappler ever. It's impossible for me to be fully objective about him. But after talking with a bunch of people that I respect, here's where I rank him. I said he was the shoulder pick, so let's start with him. Why does he get into the top five? It's not just the six world championships in a row 
or the two ADCC titles. It's not just that he dominated the competition over multiple rule sets, losing only once at ADCC and once at the Worlds over a period of like seven years with an insane division to compete with. That's crazy. It was how he did it and who he did it against. Shanji and Hoffa both competed against very against the best of the best, but what tipped the scales was Hoffa's victories over another guy who could easily be top five, Rubens Cobrinha. So you already heard what Cobrinha's qualifications are. And again, one of the most these are two of the most incredible jujitsu athletes to watch. You can't go wrong by watching a Hoffa match or a Cobrinha match, especially one they had with each other. But here's a stat that's going to blow your mind. Cobrinha has only been submitted in competition in his entire illustrious 15 to 20 year career. He's been submitted twice. One was by Hadolfo Vieira, who is a top 15 guy and an ultra heavyweight. The other was by Rafael Mendez at the Pans. And you can find a link to that match in, in the comments. He did that at the Pans in 2015. And if you haven't seen it, you absolutely have to check it out because nobody has even come close. And the, the, the first couple of years I went to the Worlds, I would watch the featherweight division and Cobrinha would handily beat everyone joyfully laughing, having a great time. And then he would fight Hoffa. And that was, it, we were just privileged to get to watch that. So when you only get submitted by two, it, it, twice in your entire career, once by an all time top 15 guy, who's also a heavyweight. And then the other is by this guy that says something. So who's number four, Andre Galvao people. And, and Galvao is funny because Hoffa was dominant over a limited number of years, but Galvao has sustained excellence over decades, and he has a similar sort of record to Shanji, but there's a couple of things that gets him into the top five. So he's a five-time IBJJF world champion in the Gi, and he would have had more if he hadn't gotten angry one year and jumped the barricade to yell at the ref who had just ruled against his fighter. Yes, I was there for yet. Yes, that was hilarious. Yes, he shouldn't have done it. But it's at ADCC where he really made his hay and where he really shone. He's a two-time ADCC champ, including one in absolute but he's a four-time ADCC super fight champ. Now, I want to explain to you why that's so impressive. This means he hasn't lost at ADCC, which is the toughest no-gi grappling event in the world with the best competitors, hasn't lost at ADCC in over a decade. He's beaten Braulio Estima, who is a triple crown winner, one of only seven guys to do that. He's beaten all-time greats in Cyber Gabreo, multiple-time world champion in all kinds of different modalities. He's beat Claudio Colasans. He's beaten Philippe Pena, who was, when, when Galva beat him, considered maybe the best no-gi guy in the world. So elite, elite competition. And remember that the ADCC super fight is between the two guys who've won absolute. So the best of the best of the best collide, and Galva beats them all. Other than Gordon, uh, so... So yeah, and Pena was, you know, a lot of people would say Gordon Ryan was the best Nogi guy at the time, but Philippe and Gordon had split matches that year. And so, you know, Philippe's in that conversation. And for, for, for Galvao to beat him, that is an absolute signature win for anybody, but especially an all-time great like Galvao. And Galvao beat him and was never in danger. By the way, Galvao turns 38 in September. And so that record of sustained excellence is just uh, crazy. His match with Huron Gracie is really worth watching too. And I just want to say one thing about that match with Huron, which is a draw. I've linked to that match, not just because it's an incredible match with two incredible guys, but it also really demonstrates the split between self-defense jujitsu for survival and sport jujitsu for attack. That was at Metamoris and it was a 20 minute time limit match. And Galvao spends the first 10 to 15 minutes just coming at Huron and trying to submit him and submit him and submit him. Whereas Huron just defends because he is coming at it from a self-defense mindset. And then Galvao tires because it's tough to try to just crush someone for 15 minutes. And then Huron starts to do some things. So it's a, not only is it worth watching because the two guys involved are incredible, but it also really represents two different mindsets. And uh, so really recommend watching that. So if Galvao's number four, who's number three? Marcus Buchecha Almeida. And we are, this is one of those guys that is still competing. And he has a shot, a shot at being considered the greatest of all time before he's through. Although I don't think he will for reasons that will become clear. So may, he may eventually have a claim to number one status because he's still a pretty young guy. One of the great what ifs of history is that what if Buchecha had not blown out his knee at the 2015 Worlds, which he did. Not only did he have to take a year off because of the injury, but back then, Buchecha was a super heavyweight that moved like a featherweight. And again, you absolutely have to. If you watch two matches as a result of this talk, watch Hoffa versus Cobrinha and watch Buchecha versus Hadolfo. Incredibly exciting. Four all-time greats. You cannot go wrong. And you just see how this 230-pound badass is moving like Hoffa Mendez. And that's crazy. Then he hurt his knee. And I'm not going to say he was never the same, but his style certainly changed. Now, 
even given that, he has two ADCC titles, and his only loss was in absolute finals to Gordon Ryan, who he lost to by a penalty point. So not a submission, not points, not an advantage, but a stalling penalty, which is a tough pill to swallow, but tells you the level he's at, especially if you can hold Gordon Ryan in high regard, which you should. But that's not his most imp impressive achievement. As it stands today, he has the most IBJJF gold medals from the world's ever. 13 gold medals, six absolute championships. Shockingly, he should have more because he stepped aside and, and in 2018 to let his friend Leandro Lowe win the world, the absolute world title. Lowe had injured his shoulder and couldn't do the finals against Buchecha. And so Buchecha stepped aside and just let him take the medal. So he should have 14 gold medals. So he has more IBJJF gold medals than ever, anybody ever. He has championships in Nogi at the most prestigious Nogi event ever. So why isn't he number one? How can he possibly be number three? Number two is Marcelo Garcia. And I want to explain to y'all, because some of y'all are lucky enough to have been there during Marcelo's prime and when he was competing. And if you weren't, I don't, you should go back and watch his matches too, because it's really tough to understand how good he was. I'm going to try to explain this to you. So it's hard to argue against Andre Galvao as the ADCC greatest until you see Marcelo Garcia's resume. Let's not forget though, before we get into ADCC, that Marcelo won five world championships in the Gi too. And that alone would be enough to get him on his list, but he also won ADCC in his weight class a staggering four times. What's even more impressive to me, though, is his performance in absolute. Marcelo competed in the 170-pound division. Fun fact, the only match he ever lost in his weight class was to Pablo Popovich, who was really like a 200-pound guy who cut down to 170. That match caused ADCC to reform the weight cut rules, so you have to do same-day weigh-ins now. The only person that ever was able to beat him in his weight class wasn't really in his weight class. But let's talk about Marcelo in absolute. So 170 pound guy, 77 kilograms is where he won his four ADCC gold medals, competing against and beating guys with 50 pounds of muscle on him. Dudes that were 99 kilograms and up, 220 pounds and up. His match with Rico Rodriguez at ADCC is legendary for good reason. And he has both a silver medal and a bronze in absolute from ADCC. Only losing to all time greats who were much bigger than him. Robert Drysdale and Ronaldo Jacare Souza, both of whom are all-time greats, both of whom are huge, jacked-up dudes. Now, the year that he lost to Jacare, 2005, he only lost to Jacare and submitted everyone else. So he submits everyone, and the only cat he loses to is a guy in absolute who is also an all-time great. That's an incredible achievement. Can we also, for a second, just talk about that 2005 ADCC, which has a podium of Hodger Gracie at the top, Jacare Souza, and Marcelo Garcia, that's the best podium ever. And we'll, you'll see exactly how impressive that is too in just one second. Again, Marcelo had, had submitted seven opponents before he lost to Jacare. He also retired relatively young to focus on his school. So keep in mind, these numbers could be a lot higher. But, and this is another one of the coolest things ever, the, the, the two other reasons that you have to love Marcelo. First, he's one of the truly nice, decent dudes in jiu-jitsu. One of the true good guys in jiu-jitsu. And everybody says that who's encountered him. And so that's worth noting. It's worth noting, second, that he says he's going to come back for ADCC, not this one, but the next one in two years after that, so that he can compete at ADCC over 40. So in terms of team old guys, I hope he comes back and I hope he wins. And I hope he wins, especially because he said his one criteria, his one condition for coming back was no trash talk. I just love that guy. And you should love that guy. And he is number two and number one in our hearts. So if these are the dudes whose qualifications get them into the top five, who's number one? And that is the great Hodger Gracie. Now, I will be honest, I, I, I've thrown out a lot of caveats, right, about like, well, it's hard to compare across eras. It's hard to compare against modalities, gi versus no gi, blah, blah, blah. It's difficult to compare against generations, right, to say who is to say who had the tougher field, you know, more people in the division. That is difficult. The, you know, everybody always already asks, you know, but the only person that's ever made that an easy comparison is Hodger Gracie. So Hodger not only has um, what beat all the elite black belts in the world and has 10 IBJJF gold medals, including absolute championships. Not, what about Nogi, do you ask? Well, he won ADCC at his weight and absolute in 2005. He also at that ADCC became the only person ever to submit all his opponents at ADCC, 
He submitted eight people in a row, also a record, a record of the most submissions in, you know, at any ADCC event. He submitted eight guys, world-class guys, including Ronaldo Jacare, right? But he also, um, you know how only seven people have won ADCC, have won the absolute and won the super fight? Yeah, he's one of those, of course. He also, in the Gi, the IBJJF, not only did he win the IBJJF Worlds, not only did he submit all of his opponents, but one year he submitted all of his opponents using the mounted cross collar choke, which is a technique on every blue belt curriculum in America. Submitted all the elite black belts in the world in a row using a blue belt move. That's crazy. But you might ask why, I said it's tough to compare across eras, right? You always hear about like, oh, the game changes, it evolves. How could the new school compete with the old school? Well, in 2017, and some of you may know this, some of you don't. I envy you if you're hearing about this for the first time. So in 2017, Hodger had been away from jiu-jitsu, hadn't competed in four years, had been off focusing on MMA, focusing on running his school. In 2017, Marcus Buchecha Almeida, who, as you recall, is number three and, you know, has more IBJJF gold medals than anybody. In 2017, Marcus Buchecha had won his weight class and absolute at IBJJF Worlds. He had also won ADCC. He was indisputably the best guy in the world at the time. Not only did Hodger come back after a four-year layoff, not only did he compete against Buchecha, not only did he beat him, but he submitted him. And he submitted him with a sliding collar choke from the back, another technique that is on every blue belt curriculum in America. The only one of these people that makes everything easy is Hodger Gracie. If you name an honor, he's won it. The IBJJF Worlds in the Gi, 10 times, three of them in the absolute. During one of those, submits everybody. Has he won ADCC? Not only has he won it, he submitted everybody while doing it. Not only did he do that, he set a record with the number of submissions. Is he one of the guys who's won the Triple Crown? He absolutely is. Has he won super fights? Oh, only against the best guy of the new school and one of the top five of all time. So there are lots. Oh, and by the way, Hodger was 36 at the time and Buchecha was 27. And so as far as team old guy, team old school jujitsu guy, Hodger Gracie, uh, just it continues to impress. It's hard to make a case for anyone else as the all around best ever. And final thought I'll leave you with before we get into, before we end things and put a cap on it. Imagine if he hadn't taken those four years off. Imagine how many world titles he'd won. So folks, I, I had a blast preparing this. I had a blast presenting it. I hope that you all enjoyed it. I'm happy to spend time answering as many questions as you all want. Before I do, I'm gonna show you this, which is, I have 10 or so matches for y'all to watch. Hadja Buchecha 2, the first match was a draw. It's also worth watching, but Hadja Buchecha 2 is the money match. Second, Hadolfo Vieira versus Buchecha. Again, roundly considered the best uh, jiu-jitsu match of all time for terms of excitement. Hanet Stack versus Leticia Hibero, two legends in the top five going at each other in a super fight. I have two matches between Bia Mesquita and Michele Nicolini, the top two women of all time, one from 2011, one from 2014, one no gi, one in the gi. Enjoy both of those. Also, if you want, again, Hoffa versus Cobrinha, uh, you should also watch every Hoffa, every Hoffa Mendez highlight. They're just joy inducing. And if you can find it, Hoffa's match with Mario Hayes, which he finishes with, wait for it, a wrist lock. I also have a link to Michelle Nicolini's match with Tammy Musumici. Tammy, one of the best of the new school and one of the best American women competing, world champion, awesome lady. Um, I will warn you, that is a gross match. There is a grisly dislocation of a joint. So if you have a weak stomach, do not watch it. Some of you are like going to click on that next. Also, Gabby Garcia, if you want to see how massive Gabby is compared to even another uh, heavyweight lady, watch that match. And it's a really interesting clash of styles between old school and new school in a well. So I think you will be very impressed with Mattielli. Finally, the last two I'll recommend, Andre Govau submitting Pablo Popovich at ABCC, which nobody had ever done before, and Andre's match with Huron Gracie, which goes to a draw, and which I have already recommended. I won't say more about that, but feel free to explore those on your own time. Please do enjoy them. But you know who the real goat is? indisputably you all are the greatest of all time for watching this i've had a blast preparing this five class series i hope you have as well thank you for watching share with your friends if you want if not just train jujitsu love jujitsu be a good person spread jujitsu spread good vibes and thank you all ever so much thank you jeff happy to do it y'all i know we went a little bit over i want to thank you all for your kind patience and if anybody has any questions about anything we covered at any point in any of the five classes I am, I am here for y'all. Also, sorry I talked so fast, but had a lot to cover.
All right, folks. I will say um, going once, going twice. And hearing none, let me just thank you again for watching. You guys are awesome. Support your local Jiu-Jitsu Academy, especially if it's ours. And we will see you as soon as we possibly can. Stay safe out there. Don't get corona. Stay inside and watch Jiu-Jitsu videos. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks, y'all. Thanks, Pam. Thanks, bud.